magnify your name. You know, there's a text of scripture in Exodus chapter 6. In Exodus 6, the reason we sang this song is because of what Jehovah says, the Lord says in Exodus 6. The first one says, Then the Lord, please take your seats. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. Hallelujah. Amen. Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go. And with a strong hand shall he drive them out. And God said unto Moses, and said unto him, I am the Lord. Someone say, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. Huh. But someone say, he is the Lord. He is the Lord. Then in verse 3, he said, I am the Lord, and I appear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty. Exodus 6. Uh, this is where we see those who bring Bibles. We don't bring Bibles to church services. Just open the Bible to Exodus 6. I appeal unto these patriarchs by my name, Almighty God. Then listen to the next line. But by my name, Jehovah, was I not known. Hallelujah. Even though Abraham has some fights, even though Jacob has some wrestlings, even though Isaac was, in, was confronted by King Abimelech and all that, he said, but by my name Jehovah, they have not known me. But now I appear unto you and unto Israel by the name Jehovah, the warrior God. Hallelujah. Amen. And there is a battle being fought and the God who leads the battle is a warrior God. Hallelujah. He is a God who fights our cause. Glory be to God. That's why I love the song. Mighty warrior is great in battle. That whatever battle that stands in front of us, before us, our God, the mighty warrior, wins. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, so that was a bit anemic. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hmm. But by my name, Jehovah, was I not known unto them. And now I appear by his name, Jehovah. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. This morning we would like to turn our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. God is good. This morning looks like a, a praise morning, you know. Maybe, but the word of God must be preached, so. God be the glory. Hmm. It says, for this ye know that no warmonger no unclean person no covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God I really guess that we will get the import of this text. For those you know, no warmonger, no unclean person, no covetous man had any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. This morning we have 
before us. An alarming warning. The Holy Ghost saw it necessary to put such a warning here to the Christian church and for us. And for that matter, for all of us who confess that we are Christians. So we will do well to take this morning seriously. Because in the midst of all he's talking about, he present this morning. And no one no unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. But he begins, the, the way he begins the warning is interesting. And I want us to take note of it, the way he begins it. He says, for this you know. That means, Ephesian church, you are aware of this. If you have so learned Christ, I say in, as, as it says in chapter 4 verse 20, if you so learned Christ, and this is something you know already, or anyone who profess to be a Christian should know this already. It means that when you come into this relationship with Christ, this is one thing that is unmistakably clear to you. For this you know. You are already aware of this. It is not a truth that the apostle needed to labor upon so much because it was clear to them that those who engage in porn things like pornographic things, unclean things, and those who are also given to covetousness, love of money, which is what you say is idolatry. They love money so much that they will sacrifice a human being for money. They will sacrifice if they need, if they will sacrifice Christ for money. If you put truth of God and money there, they will take money. So you have to understand. Anyone who is like that has no inheritance in the kingdom of God, of, of Christ. And of God. Now the question is, why should this warning be given to Christians? Especially when he says, for this you know. For this you know. So if Christians know this, then why does the apostle take time to talk about it? Why does the Holy Ghost inspired the apostle to write this in Holy Writ. You see, very often we do not seem to know the things that we are supposed to know. There's some things we meant to know, but we don't seem to know them as we ought to. And sometimes, so and sometimes when we even know them, we know them just merely, just, just merely uh, know them. That's, it's, just, it's just theory. It's just in our heads. It's, not, it's just something that we've heard said. We've just heard it in passing. It's not something that is really conscious in our mind. And because it's not conscious in our minds, it is not practiced. And that's the reason why we need 
inicio de las 16. But why though? Why should be that as Christians, things that we want to know, we don't know, or things that yet we don't seem to know, and then even if we've heard about them, they're not really practical in our lives. Why is that so? I offer three reasons why this is also the case. Three reasons. Three reasons. First, the first reason is this. We look at salvation in Christ as a private thing. And someone says, well, it is personal. My Christianity is personal between me and God. Yes, I understand. I understand that your relationship is personal, is private. And I understand your prayers are probably in private. But I'm sorry to say, your faith is not. Oh yes, the Christian faith is not. Neither did the faith of Israel in God meant what ever meant to be private. Because through Israel, God was to turn all the nations unto himself. How could he them be private? Men were to see clearly Faith is not private. So you can't say, well, it's, it's the way I'm living my life. So because we look at salvation in this private man. And because we look at salvation in a private manner, we tend to consider the things that we deem important in life and as the basis for Christianity. And we approach God, the thing that I think is important, it is for that reason I approach God. So it's all a private, personal, and the word I'm referring myself to use is a subjective Christianity. Yes, inward looking Christianity. Well, it's just, it's just how you look at it, how you think about it. And it's what I, I have. I have this need. I have this thing that I want. That is, that's the reason why I'm serving God. So you realize that many people want that need is satisfied. And that's it. Because it's just a subjective thing. So we tend to forget the utmost reason why we are Christians. And we forget that we are in a kingdom. And that kingdom is a holy kingdom. It's a holy, righteous kingdom. So I'll say it again. Many people engage, and when I say many people, I do not mean adults, I mean children, and I mean anyone who ever claims Christianity. And who does not seem to walk them walk, it is because what we want to know, we don't know. Because we don't really give our minds to it. Sometimes when a preacher is going on, I'm playing games. That is when people are making funny jokes. Turning to people's faces and making funny, funny jokes. Indicating serious lack of respect for God. And this thing goes on in so-called house of God. And people think it is all right. But if in the house of God, 
where God's respected, you are able to be messing around. Then where God is not present, what will you do? Because where you got to have the greatest respect and fear for God, you don't. Then where God is not, <laughs> God has mercy. Men are in trouble. And men ought to fear such people. Because such people are dangerous. Such hearts are dangerous. Secondly, the reason why these things are, are occur is because oftentimes I excuse myself for the things I do wrong and then I accuse other people for the same thing that I excuse myself. I'm doing it People are doing the same thing and they have a reason why, an excuse, tangible reason why, but well, it's because of my circumstance and God understands. But when another person is in the same situation, oh, that is simple, that is wrong. Sometimes it amazes how a person can turn away from his own sins, look at another person and say, you, why are you doing that? And it just tries to say, You've got a beam in your eye. And you are able to go past the beam to see a little speck in your brother's eye. Says, cast the beam out of your eye, then you can see clearly the little spot in your brother's eye. God have mercy. Amen. And why is that so? Because no one wants to feel miserable. That's why we excuse ourselves. Because if I admit that I'm in the wrong, it makes me miserable. And people don't want that. What do we want? Happiness. I want to be happy. And then they sing a song. Whatever makes you happy, that, 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 that's it. Someone comes to you with a challenge. They are in a, some, should I do this or not? Then the psychologist will, will ask the question, what makes you happy? So that makes me happy. Oh, then do it. Really? Because the psychologists have thrown away God. God is in part of the world. God is just now. But then I ask myself, since you're a psychologist, someone who really deals with the mind and think about it, how do you think you, you, you came about? Have you asked the question, how your bones were formed in the womb? It is for this reason, and that's my third one, it's, it is for this reason that the apostle condemned the Roman, uh, the, the Jewish Christians in Rome. When he writes to them. And Romans 2, verse 1 to 6, he picks up this argument. He says, Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you that judges does the same thing. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou, O oh man, that that judges them which do such things, and does the same, that you shall escape the judgment of God? Oh, despise thou the riches of his of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Some people don't realize that the fact that they are doing certain things and they seem to be and they think they are getting away with it, not realizing that the forbearance, God forbearing, the, the patience of God towards them, they don't realize that it is supposed to lead them to repentance. But rather, people interpret it as well. It's a, it's a right. Do you get a picture? Mm -hmm. If it was not for the forbearance of God, although a holy God, and the long suffering of God, the moment a person goes off the line, they just strike you. 
See, so they fear the demonic well more than God. Because people go to make evil covenants in the courts, in the voodoo places. And when they make a one mistake, they are, they, are, they are struck off. But then with God, because he's long-suffering, and he said the reason why he's long-suffering is so that people would come to the place of repentance. But that's God's whole purpose. That we will change and come back to the right track. But people take that for granted. But God have mercy. So it's for these reasons that the Bible here warns us in Ephesians that no one longer, no unclean person, no religious person has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. God have mercy. Amen. So what we need to be aware is that in Christianity, God does shape us. Hallelujah. Amen. God does correct us. The term, the term Hebrews uses is chasing. He corrects us. He chases us. He puts us. And why does he do that? Is because he is preparing us for life with himself. God does not just save us. Yes, save and then I say. I put a badge. Save. Badge. God intends that we walk with him and life with him. Together with him. Hallelujah. Yeah. That is it. So when you read Hebrews, which we read earlier on, if you read the Hebrews passage. The 12th uh, chapter and the 5th verse, it reads, And you have forgotten the, the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord chasteneth, sorry, loveth, he chasteneth. And scorneth every son whom he received. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. But what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? And then the verse 11 says, Now, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous. No chastening. When God is chastening you, it doesn't seem joyful, does it? But grievous, never. Nevertheless, after one, it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are excited by. Why are we saying this? We're saying that because we approach Christianity with our personal happiness as an ultimate goal while we're Christians, we often miss the truth that Christianity really it's not about you achieving personal happiness, but rather about holiness unto God. Happiness or holiness? The Bible says Christianity is about holiness unto God. The goal, the reason why we are Christians is Holiness unto God. Hallelujah. Amen. It is what? Holiness. Holiness. Unto God. Tell your neighbor. The goal of Christianity, the goal of Christianity is holiness, is holiness unto, God. unto God. One more time. The goal of Christianity it's holiness unto 
Right. Now let me get into my text now. Ephesians 5, 5. This expression which we have in Ephesians 5, 5, where he says, for this you know, that you know. Or to say in other verses, he says, no you don't. It is a very important phrase because the apostle keeps using it in, 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 in almost all of his writings. And anytime he uses this phrase, it has something to do with holiness. For this you know. Other times he would say, No, ye not. No, ye not. If we go to Corinthians, come with me to Corinthians, first Corinthians chapter 6, please. First Corinthians 6. The ninth, the tenth verse. First Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. It reads, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Hello? Be not deceived. God is deceived. We are easily deceived. Oh, it doesn't matter. No, God says it doesn't matter. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortionists shall inherit the kingdom of Chapter 15, verse 33, of the same book, same verse on this. Chapter 15, and then verse 33. It reads, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good minds. Away to righteousness, and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. Save the knowledge, don't you know? For you know knowledge of God. And then he asks, I speak this to your shame. And then again in 2 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 16, let's read it. The, the second chapter, following on from the first Corinthians. To God be the glory. Chapter 6 and the 14th verse. He reads, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has unrighteousness with right, has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has darkness has he that believed with an, with an infidel? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So what the apostle commands here is that you cannot mix light and darkness. A favorite philosopher put it this way. He says, there is no average mean between light and dark. You cannot strike an average knee. That means there is no gray areas in God. This is gray. Hello? As we see in 1 John chapter 5, chapter 1, verse 5, so this is a message we have heard from God. That God dwells where? In life. We declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say, watch this, if we say we have relationship or fellowship with God or with, with him and we walk in darkness, what do we do? We lie. We lie and do not the truth.
And when you go to the second chapter of the same book, um, the, the, second, the second chapter and the fourth verse, he says, He that said, I know him, and keep back his commandment, is a See, a person says, I know God, I'm a Christian, but does not keep the commandment of God. Bible say that person is a liar. He's lying. Hello. So he recalls all these things. And then when he goes, and in the last book of the Bible, as if God was God was saying, you know, before you end, let me remind you again. Revelation 21. It's because before you close the book, let me remind you again. And guess what? It's in the very last chapter 2. Chapter 21, verse 27. Let, let's have a look at it. 21, 27. And he goes. And there shall in no wise enter into it. Anything that defileth. Neither was there ever work an abomination or make it a lie. But they which are written in the last book of life. That means no one shall enter into that city, that holy city of God, who is a defiler, who works abomination, who lives in a lie, or who lives a lie. It doesn't end there. The last chapter. In the 14th verse, he reads, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. Hallelujah! Amen. What did he say? Blessed are those who do what? Oh, come on, come on. Blessed are those who do what? His Sorry. Blessed are they who do what? His commandments. Blessed are they who do his commandments. They do his commandments. That is it. They have the right to show five. And then verse 15. But without, oh, but without, that's a serious word there. Without are dogs, sorcerers, Talking about witches and all their classmates. <laughs> and warmongers, murderers, idolaters, and whosoever love it, they love it and make it lie. You love lying and you are a liar. <laughs> Have no inheritance in it. Those who make a lie. But who are those who make a lie? Let's not get it wrong here. Yeah. Who are those who are the liars? Who are liars? Because the Bible is saying that we need to understand this very, very clear that liars have no part in the kingdom of God. In 1 John 2, 1 John 2, for who are the liars? Let's go back to it. 1 John 2. Because we don't want to miss this point here. First John 2, 4. He that said, I know him, and keepeth not the commandments of God, God says that person is a liar. So you say you know God, but you see your own happiness, and you ignore the truth of God. God says that person no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. If this is not a serious warning, then I don't know what is to be called a warning. As much as a person who is far of lying clearly is this is is overruling the command.
commandment of God. Here we see that clearly it is for those who say they are Christians, but are not keeping the word of God. So that person is a liar. And he has no part in the kingdom of God. So are you saying that because I lie, God has struck me off the kingdom of, of God? What if just 5.5 five is not saying? Let me. He says, For this you know that no one will that no one person, and he comes all those things. What is saying? What is not saying? Is that anyone who does this, anyone who has done this thing, is cut off from the, from the kingdom of God. That's what he's saying. But the person who is constantly living in warmongering, uncleanness, and is a covetous person, has no portion. Meaning it's, it's impossible for you to, for a person to habitually be in this lifetime and still say, I belong to the kingdom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. God have mercy. So basically, anyone who is contrary to the commandments of God has no portion in the kingdom of God. From all in grace so far, that's what he's saying. Turn to your neighbor someone. Say neighbor. Yeah. Oh, say with some confidence. Neighbor. Yeah. Anyone, Anyone who lives, who lives contrary, contrary to the commandments, to the commandments of, God of God has, has no, no part, part in the kingdom of Christ, of Christ and of God. And of God. That tells you that Christ is God. It is the kingdom of Christ and of God. So then, that's not the main point there, but the point is very clear that that, that is Christ is God. You see, is this a new teaching? Oh, no. It's always been. It's always been there. Psalm 15. Psalm 15 verse 1 to 3. In Psalm 15 verse 1 to 3, the question is asked. Who? Who shall ascend? Who shall ascend? Who shall abide in thy tabernacles? Who shall dwell in the holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh take up a reproach against his neighbor. Again, that same Psalms 24. Psalm 24, the verse 3. Who shall ascend into the holy hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, vainness, vain things, nor sworn deceitfully. So the question is: that's a, that Do you see that trust into the kingdom, into the, into the holy, holy city? He says, it is only by holiness. Not pursuing personal happiness. Hello? Christianity does not promise personal happiness. It's a byproduct. It comes as you serve God. But that is not the goal. 
So if a person is is seeking, is or being a Christian for all costs, our personal happiness. And so people, anything that's being done, people seek their personal happiness. Oh, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. This this is what God wants. Oh, my, my, but this is what I want to do. And all along, a person is always seeking their personal happiness. What makes them happy? What makes them good on the inside? A person keeps on seeking those things. He's basically, he's, he's plainly telling everyone around him he's no Christian at all. Because no man can be seeking personal happiness all the time and still claim he's a Christian. It is not compatible. The goal of Christianity and the main thing is holiness before God. Happiness is a byproduct. It's something that just comes as you come. The Lord promises you joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And it's different between personal pleasure and joy. Personal pleasure. For some people, time to pray. Oh, no, no, no. My personal pleasure doesn't permit me. Some people, they, are, they, want, they, they won't have time to even pray because their personal pleasure is in the way. And even when they have to pray, their personal pleasure is right before them. When can we finish this so I can go and do my personal pleasure? God have mercy. Amen. So the question is, is your heart true to God? Someone will say, let me point this thing out, because this, this is it. Someone, some, someone will say, but, Pastor, are you not going back to preaching legalism? And you know, haven't you left grace? You talk about grace that, you know, in Christ we are saved and we are free and it doesn't matter what I do and blah, 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 blah. Friend, do not be deceived. The devil comes as an angel of light and he comes to deceive. Oh, but Christ will follow all the law so we don't have to all the commandments of God are already fulfilled in Christ. Yes. It has. <laughs> but Romans 6 verse 2. Let's read it. Romans 2, quickly. And then and the 11 verse. In Romans 6 2, it reads, God forbid that how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Yes, Christ has overcome, has overcome the law. And Christ has removed us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his, into his kingdom of light. So that we are dead to sin. So how then can we be any longer? So I agree. Christ has done all for us. But you are in the kingdom of light. You will be transformed. How can we be back in that life again? Verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. When personal pledges come, we have to understand and say, you know what? I'm a new man. Let me read this scripture to us. Because if I am a Christian, and I'm living in the light. Because God was in light. You heard that the on yet? God was in light. There's no darkness in God. And I'm and I'm living my life before God. How then can I be rebellious towards God's commandment? God's law, God's commands. Hello? How is that possible? Romans 8, verse 3 says, They that are of the spirit. Romans 8 3. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, 
God sending his own son in light of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, oftentimes, when the word flesh is used in the Bible, we are thinking of our physical body. No, 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 no. The Bible is not talking about a physical body here. It is talking about the inward appetites. Hello? They that, they that walk after the flesh, sorry, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So they that walk after the spirit do not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Not your body. Not the flesh. So you say, well, that's really unreasonable. It's an old book. No, it was talking about appetites. So the spirit of God wants you to, the, the spirit of God is indicating this. But then my personal appetites says this is what should be done. That's what we're talking about here. So, when my personal appetites makes me not think, not care, not mind what God wants, clearly, He's telling me I need to be on the lookout and I have no portion in the kingdom of Christ and of God. God have mercy. So then, am I saying that we are made, we are saved by our own holiness? Is that what we are saying? Hello? Hi. We are not saved by our own holiness. Tell your neighbor. We are not saved by our own holiness. We are not saved by our own holiness. Oh, your neighbor didn't hear you. Yeah. We are not saved by our own holiness. You see, we are justified by God, by faith. Hello? Hi. It's by faith that justified. Is it? Is it? Yes. Let's read the scripture. Romans 8, verse, verse, verse 30. Romans, the same chapter. Get good to verse 30. Romans 8, verse 30. It reads, Moreover, who did this predestinate? Then he also called. And who be called, then be also justified. And who be justified, then be also glorified. Hallelujah. Amen. So we shall be glorified. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And I want to have this one. First Corinthians 6, verse 9. So verse, first Corinthians 6, verse 11. It reads, And such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified. But you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Hallelujah. Amen. We were in the old life. We were, we were in the world. But now we are sanctified. Now we are justified. Now we are washed. Hallelujah. Amen. This is what God has done in us. And because of what God has done in us, we will say that we are bona fide children of the living God. Okay. So as bona fide children of the living God, then there are certain things that we cannot associate with anymore. Oh, but, but, but it's all by grace now. Oh, yes, I know. It's all by grace. So come with me to Titus 2, verse 11 and 12. Titus 2, because it's all by grace now. Yes, I understand that. It's all by grace. If it's not by, by, by grace, what, what shall we do? Verse, verse 11 and 12, Titus. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation. What was salvation? Grace. grace. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to who? All men. And what is that grace doing? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, 
righteously and goodly in this present world. So the grace that we are hanging on so much, the grace that we are holding on to so much, that same grace is teaching, is doing a teaching in our lives. That same grace teaches us to deny ungodliness. And what is it? No to ungodliness. No to worldliness. That, that we will live righteously, sober, and godly in this present world. I thought I was going to hear a big hallelujah on that. Amen. I'm saying that grace which we have received. That grace that has made us born again. That grace that has sanctified us. That grace that has saved us. That grace in which we live and move and have our being. That grace is doing something in our hearts. That grace is doing something in our lives. That grace is teaching us. It is teaching us. It's a present continuous thing. It is teaching us. It's teaching us to deny Hallelujah! Amen. Thank God for the grace. Hallelujah. Thank God for His grace. Amen. So if this grace is teaching me, if this grace is educating me, if this grace is working my life, then if I'm habitually in this uncleanness, in this sense, if I'm habitually disregarding the commandments of God, I am in that life constantly. I have no passion. My appetite, my personal happiness is my goal in life. I will fulfill my personal happiness than God's holy call. Then it's a clear indication this grace is not in me. Here I rest. So then, Ephesians 5, 5 then becomes a test for, for us. For this you know that no one longer, no unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. So what this word, so we need these kind of Words or warnings in scripture to always remind us where we are. Hallelujah. Amen. Because there are some who seem to forget. And if you've forgotten, to be reminded. And come back. So every now and then we need to be reminded. Because this grace, the grace is teaching us to deny what worldly does. That means that the worldly love and the ungodliness are present around us. And the saint might find himself going to these things. So we need these kind of texts, like Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5, and others to always be around us. Because this grace. Which has appeared to all men, which is in us teaching us, is doing something. It is sanctifying us. What did, what did Christ say in John 17, verse 17? Sanctify them through thy truth, for thy word is true. And this is the word of God. This text is the word of God. So it is doing the sanctifying. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory and what did he say in John chapter 8, verse 31? If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. If we continue in the word. So the question is, are we continuing in the word of God? Hello. So, in this text, Cause you to become watchful about certain deceitful things 
that can easily creep into the heart, creep into the lifestyle. It is doing the job. Then you are indeed a child of God. Then indeed there is grace in your heart. But if this text annoys you, you hate it. A person will hear this and then just shut the door or just close the window and just walk out. Then it means your time is about up to ask for mercy. That God save me for I don't have salvation. God have mercy. You see, friends, what I say to you today is that God is a holy God. He's a consuming fire to those who have no sin grace in their souls. He's terrible. He's terrifying. But to the saints, he's sweet. He's love. The God we serve is a holy God. And the purpose of becoming Christians is holiness. I'm not preaching the galaxy, but I'm preaching what the scripture teaches in Titus chapter 2, 11 and 12. And the grace we have received teaches us to deny worldly lusts and ungodliness. For in God there is no darkness, He lives in the light. And if we are walking towards this holy city, then what is required is holiness. Blamelessness before God. If we have this hope in us, 1 John 3, 3 says, anyone who has this hope in him purifies himself. So if a person is not purifying himself, it's indication he has not this hope in him. For anyone who has this hope in him purifies himself. It's mindful of God. And it's conscious. Personal happiness does not override God's call. Oh, I'm tired. Oh, I can't do this thing. Oh, no. No, I can't do it. No, I need to watch this. Oh, no, I need to be here. No, I need to enjoy this thing. Yeah. And then God's command is just being ignored. Hello. You see, some people think that well, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. I can skip services for about a month, then I'll show up one. Because I've heard it over, I'll be hearing it for them now. You know what? God distills, it comes like a dew, little by little, little by little. And that's what the devil cannot stand. It is a deception of the enemy to make a person think, no, yeah, but I've heard it all before. I know it. Or I, I, know, what, I, I know what you're going to preach. You're going to preach about God and Christ, isn't it? Yeah, God and Christ, yeah. God might be saved. You are deceived if that is your thinking. Because every moment of hearing the truth of God is new. And God uses it to do something in our hearts to build us. It's a deception for a person to think, oh, but today if I'm, if I'm not there, what, what would it matter? A lot would happen because the enemy then gets a chance to do whatever he wants to do with your mind and with your heart. Oh, I can pray at home alone, but God had a word for you. God had a word for you. Hello. Hi. And it's about the kingdom of God. It's because we, we make a thing so personal and private. We're not able to really relate to the kingdom of God. It's about the kingdom of God, of Christ and of God. And it's about holiness. And it's about living before Him in holiness. Happiness or holiness? What is our choice? Do we have this 
spoke in us. Are we aware or do we know that those who practice sins contrary to God have no inheritance in the kingdom of God? Does this text encourage you and strengthen you in your relationship with God? If it does, on the right path. But if your answer is no to all these things, then this morning, this is your opportunity to get your heart in the right place. Then Christ wants to give you his life. Because the life you have right now is no good to anybody. Christ doesn't want it. You can't give it to him. He doesn't want it. It's a stinking lifestyle. He has a life to give you. All we need to do is just open up and receive. Christ doesn't want your life. He wants to give you his life. That's what he came to do. So if you know you don't have this hope in you and this text annoys, it's time to have mercy. Let's be on our feature.